Thank you, Evelyn, for joining us for today's webinar on sleep and well-being. My name is Molly Buss, and I'm the Community Relations Manager at the Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. And my role for today's webinar is to moderate the chat and also facilitate the Q&A at the end of the program. Before we get started, I just wanted to give a quick introduction of the Bakken Center for those that may not be familiar with our work. It is our vision to advance the health and well-being of individuals, organizations, and communities through integrative health and healing. And in an effort to make our programming accessible during the COVID-19 pandemic, we are hosting several free webinars and providing other online resources to help you take charge of your health and well-being. And I'll share some more information about those resources via email after the webinar concludes. Today, I'm delighted to introduce doc Dr. Michael Howell, Associate Professor at the University of Minnesota's Department of Neurology. He is a neurologist with an interest in the role that sleep and circadian rhythms play in, play in brain health. And through the Athletic Sleep Medicine Training Program for Elm Health Fairview, where he is the medical director, he and his team demonstrate the importance of sleep for athletic performance. In addition, he has initiated several sleep and circadian rhythm um, wellness initiatives to decrease physician, trainee, and healthcare provider burnout. Um, so before I turn things over to Dr. Howell, I just wanted to share a few logistical items to help you navigate the webinar functions. Um, you're welcome to share your thoughts and comments via the chat box. And if you're comfortable and want to share your responses with all participants, please make sure to update the to field in the chat box to all panelists and attendees. And then just note that you have the opportunity to minimize the chat box during the presentation. And we invite for you to do that during the components that aren't interactive um, to help you stay present. There's also a Q&A icon where you can submit your questions, which uh, Dr. Howell will answer as many as he is able to at the end of the session. If you are not able to find those icons, try hovering your mouse over the bottom of the webinar screen and they should pop up for you. Um, we will send out an email after the webinar with further resources on sleep and well-being, including a recording of today's webinar and Dr. Howell's slides. I'll now turn things over to you, Dr. Howell. Oh, it looks like you're muted, just the FYI. <laughs> you would have thought I would have learned that by now. Uh, thank you so much, Molly. Um, uh, I appreciate the introduction and I am incredibly thankful uh, for the Bakken Center to, uh, for inviting me. Um, as uh, Molly mentioned, I'm a neurologist. I've spent uh, most of the last 15 years practicing sleep medicine and I've realized over that period of time that there's a tremendous number of people out there who need um, some basic sleep strategies, circadian coaching, far more than they need sleep studies, far more than they need sleep medications. And it has been um, uh, a mission of mine to try to communicate the importance uh, of sleep health, try to find, motivate, find different ways of motivating people to value sleep, as well as provide uh, non-pharmacological, uh, often behavioral-based uh, uh, strategies to help improve sleep uh, that have evidence behind them. Um, and I cannot imagine uh, a better center for collaborating uh, in these endeavors uh, than the Bakken Center. So uh, very important, first, uh, if you ever get a chance to give a, a talk on sleep, I highly recommend you start with um, a, a, a puppy sleeping video, if at all possible. So we're, I'm gonna show this to you twice. I'm gonna show it to you. Uh, first, I'm just gonna let it roll through and then we're gonna talk about it a little bit. Um, I love this video. Sleep is fascinating for a variety of reasons. What we're looking at here is we are looking at a puppy having a nightmare. How do I know that? Um, we know that because uh, the puppy is essentially paralyzed for, except for his diaphragm. You'll see his diaphragm spasming back and forth, which is a, uh, a sign that uh, the, the individual is trying to um, 
move, and the only thing it can move is its diaphragm. And for those of you who recall having nightmares before, there's often the sense of feeling frozen, like you can't move. Um, or maybe you've had a bed partner or a child who's experienced something like this. But what's interesting is how instinctual the solution to this is. When we are in REM sleep, which is when this is happening, it is a very light stage of sleep. You can speak to someone, you can calm someone down in REM sleep. So if your uh, bed partner is having a nightmare, you can say, sweetheart, it's okay, you're just having a dream. And that's what's ha what happens here. So what you'll see is, is when this little guy is having a nightmare, his, his sister actually comes over and calms him um, completely instinctual, instinctually. And notice, and notice what happens as soon as, as soon as she, as soon as she crosses him, he calms down. That's, we're, we're right in the middle, our family is right in the middle of looking for a dog. I think we would love that little sister for a, for a dog. I think that's just wonderful. All right, so moving on, uh, let's talk about modern sleep. Unfortunately, uh, as, as many of you know, uh, and may have uh, personally experienced, nearly all of us personally experience uh, sleep challenges uh, from time to time. We are, we are living in a culture that does not sleep well. Um, we have trouble falling asleep. We have trouble staying asleep. Uh, sometimes we have uh, behavioral challenges to sleep well. We um, are distracted and wanna stay entertained on our devices, or maybe we have work or other things are preoccupying us and interfering with our ability to sleep. All of this leads us to feeling tired, exhausted, and impaired during the day. Here's what we're gonna go over today. We're gonna to talk about the modern uh, challenges of sleep, but we're also gonna talk about the unique opportunities that sleep provides us to improving our lives, helping us be health, healthier, happier, and more productive. How are we gonna do this? We're gonna do this a little bit with a, uh, an example of um, a little exercise, a little thought. Uh, exercise for circadian self-discovery. This is often the first step I use with patients. Um, we use it with athletes frequently. Um, uh, I use it with healthcare providers just as an introduction to circadian coaching. And then we're going to explore a few strategies for those of you who are struggling to sleep. So I hope that you'll be able to, uh, especially for those of you who uh, are having trouble sleeping or just are interested in, in trying to help to, how to optimize your sleep, I hope you walk out with a few initial steps on how to start sleeping better. One common problem that we're not gonna talk about, um, which I'd be happy to discuss at a future time, is the challenge of snoring and sleep apnea. Uh, very pervasive, um, very distressing, has long-term cardiovascular consequences, but we're, um, I'm happy to discuss that a little bit in the Q&A session if anyone uh, would like, but for the most part, we'll pass over on sleep apnea. But let's talk about the consequences of poor sleep. We live in a world where people are not sleeping well. What is that, what is that contributing on a public health basis? Um, it contributes to high blood pressure. Oh, and I made a little challenge to myself. Um, I'm going to try to get through this entire session without discussing that which uh, it seems like we can't go five minutes without discussing. So if anyone has any questions regarding uh, the uh, topic of the day, uh, I'm happy to address it, but I'm gonna try to get through our talk and give you all a break um, from that which shall not be named. Um, but so when, when you are, are not sleeping well, yeah, and this isn't just sleep apnea, this is also um, just sleep deprivation, other insomnia, restlessness, other underlying sleep and circadian rhythm problems can lead to high blood pressure. Uh, it can lead to weight gain through a variety of mechanisms. Um, we can have increased inflammation, coagulation, which can lead to um, heart attacks. It, we can lead to strokes. More consequences that we experience. Um, when you're not sleeping well, um, you're not able to um, emotionally process information well. Um, we more often focus on the negative. And there's a lot of studies that have shown that when you're sleep deprived and you're looking at a crowd scene, you're more likely to focus on those who are upset or angry or sad. If you're sleeping well, you tend to, uh, are more likely to focus on the people who are happy, um, people have a little better perspective on life. This is particularly relevant. The most robust data uh, in this regard is on adolescence. 
Um, so is, is sleep is just incredibly important in adolescence. And we know that the more sleep deprived or more uh, adolescents and teenagers struggle with sleep, the more likely they have towards suicidal ideation, which is uh, quite terrifying. Uh, we also know that we're more likely to make uh, the wrong impulsive choices when we're not sleeping well. Uh, and that includes substance abuse. Um, and of what I'm particularly, one of the many things that I'm I interested in is in the relationship between poor sleep and healthcare provider burnout. Um, healthcare providers have a tremendous amount of stresses coming at them from all different directions, some of which we can control, much of which we, much of which we can't. Um, and what I would argue, and I think the data supports this, that the best lever to help improve uh, healthcare provider resiliency, decrease burnout, is to help, um, help physicians, nurses, uh, those of you who are caring for a loved one, sleep better. More consequences. Um, this is um, uh, in terms of helping um, the elite athletes amongst us. Um, they have great diets, they have great training regimens, but in order to have that elite athletic mind, athletic brain, you gotta sleep well. And we know that if, you were, if, if an athlete is not sleeping well, they're more likely to make mistakes um, and mental errors and penalties. This is, um, this is applicable not just to those out there who are professional or Olympic athletes, those who are just trying to get motivated to get into shape and run a marathon or just start running a little bit, um, especially under the current circumstances. Uh, those who are golfers out there. Um, and I bring this up because it is a great pride. We have a great pride in trying to find motivation wherever people are. Um, I have a lot of patients who are not particularly um, interested in changing their sleep behaviors. If you just talk about what the long-term consequences for cardiovascular disease may be 10, 15, 20 years from now. However, if I show data that demonstrates that by treating um, their sleep problem, they can actually drop their golf score by three shots around, and there's evidence for that, all of a sudden they became, become, can become quite more motivated. Maybe the challenge uh, and occurs, which occurs to a lot of us, which is just making the right healthy food choices. We know that if you are not sleeping well, it is very difficult to make the right food choices the next day. So all of this is uh, quite distressing if you hear about the, if you're not sleeping well, you have increased risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke um, and um, other challenges. But what I really want to uh, communicate is that despite all of this, sleep is one of those opportunities that you have to uh, improve upon. It is, sleep is, better sleep is very much within every individual's grasp. Maybe not perfect sleep, but certainly better sleep. All right, some of the other opportunities for sleep. So um, when you get a vaccine, a vaccination, whatever it might be, flu shot, we, pneumonia, pneumonia shot, whatever it may be, we know that your immune response depends in large part on how you slept the night before. We can actually show if we sleep deprive someone, wake them a couple of hours, up, up a couple hours early to go to work, you know, so go to work out. We know that your immune response to that vaccine is going to be less the next day. So one of the best things you can do for your immune system is sleep in. We know that when you're sleeping better, your brain clears out toxins. So your cells, every cell in your body is clearing out metabolic waste all day long. Um, in the rest of your body, outside of the nervous system, you have your lymphatic system. Your lymphatic system is draining all of those metabolic toxins. In the brain, you have something called the glymphatic system. And it is during sleep when it clears out. So if you're not sleeping well, you can't clear out those toxins. One of those that we know is a beta amyloid, which builds up in park, uh, which builds up in Alzheimer's disease, as well as in concussions. Um, and so if, for nothing else, you just want to decrease your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Sleeping better is one of the best things that you can do for yourself. Um, on the right there, that's Sarah Hughes. She won the gold medal back in 2002. I love this story because it illustrates how different we need to think about um, sleep when it, when it comes to athletic performance. So she was a great skater. 
She was, she was trying to make the U.S. Olympic team. Um, Michelle Kwan was the favorite to win the Olympic gold that year. This was in Salt Lake City. And fortunately, her family met um, uh, Dr. Moss at Cornell, who, um, because she was uh, struggling with some sleep challenges, she had plateaued in her athletic performance. And what he suggested is that she stop getting up at four o'clock in the morning for training, which was um, thought to be crazy uh, for any uh, Olympic athlete, they pride themselves often on uh, training as much as possible and sacrificing sleep for that training. The problem is, is when you sacrifice sleep, you're no longer laying down all of those critical brain pathways that help you do the things that you want to do. Um, whether or not it's landing a triple axle, uh, whether or not it's hitting a fastball at 97 miles an hour, or whether or not it's trying to learn the clarinet or a foreign language. Um, they cut out the morning practices, and she was the first um, uh, woman to ever land uh, three triple axles in the long program and won the gold medal. Uh, on the left there, that's the Stanford uh, men's basketball team. Much of the uh, work that I'm citing comes out of Stanford. Uh, they took the men's basketball team, just in, uh, created a, uh, worked with their professors uh, to uh, increase their sleep intake by about an hour. And what they found is, is they had about a 10% increase uh, in free throw shooting, three point shooting, and um, a lot of different measurements, one of which was how they felt about each other. Um, so just the, the team camaraderie improved merely by uh, improving sleep. There are so many things that I love about uh, taking care of people with sleep problems. Uh, one of which is, is that most evidence-based therapies are non-pharmacological. I don't have anything against medication. I'm a neurologist. Um, many people with uh, multiple sclerosis uh, strokes, epilepsy, they need medications. Absolutely, uh, we should use medications in those circumstances. The problem is, is that there are so many people out there with sleep challenges, there is not enough of me to go around to take care of all of them. And so what, what most people really need is sleep coaching, sleep training, uh, which can be, uh, you, you can receive from someone who's not a physician, uh, you can receive through uh, formats like this. Um, uh, it really is critical that we have knowledge sharing, knowledge transfer. Um, and one of the way I often will describe it uh, to uh, medical students or to patients themselves is that if you don't walk out of a visit with me or leave a virtual experience like this, having some degree of a deeper understanding of what your sleep problem is and what your circadian rhythm is, you're not gonna get better. Um, and so it really, uh, the burden is on us to help communicate sleep and circadian rhythm challenges in a way that's different that you haven't heard of or thought of before. And in that regard, when people think about sleep challenges, one of the last things they often think about is where sleep fits in their underlying 24 hour circadian rhythm. And that is where sleep well being begins. And to do this, we're going to go on a little bit of a thought experiment. I'd ask everyone uh, to do this right now. I do this with um, athletes. Uh, I do sleep coaching and training with. I do this with patients. All right, so here's the, here's the scenario uh, I'd like to send you to paradise for three months. Um, in this, uh, and, and that could be Hawaii is the, is the, what I often use. Some people use Tahiti, could be the mountains. I don't really, what, whatever is paradise for you. Here's the catch. Um, everything is taken care of. Work is taken care of. Um, if you love work, it's waiting for you when you get back home, but you're not able, allowed to focus on it when you uh, are in paradise. Money is taken care of. Kids are taken care of health problems are taken care of, everything is taken care of. And the only thing I ask is that you just be mindful of when you naturally get sleepy and when you naturally wake up. And this, this, it, this for many individuals, this is a much um, more difficult thought experiment than it appears uh, at first glance. In particular, I want you to imagine a scenario where uh, there's no caffeine, there's no alcohol, you don't have any uh, sedating medications, and we're just trying to figure out what is the 
natural time when your body and your brain would naturally fall asleep. I don't want to know when you would like to fall asleep. Oftentimes when I, we start having a conversation with an individual, they'll be like, oh my goodness, what I would love more than anything else is I'd love to fall asleep at 10 and wake up at 6. In this case, I don't care what you would like it to be. I would like to know what it is. We have to find, in order to help you sleep better, we need to know where you are starting from. It's like trying to tell someone how to get to Denver uh, if you don't know where they're, where they're starting from. Are they starting in Alberta or are they starting in Austin, Austin, Texas? Uh, where you're starting makes a tremendous difference. So under back, to, back into paradise, you don't have any constraints on your time. You are just listening, you're just listening to your body. And if that means for many individuals, not all, but for many individuals who are at home trying to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, if they just listen to their natural biological rhythm, they wouldn't go to bed at 10, which is totally, which is completely fine. Um, they can, in this experiment, they can without guilt stay up uh, as late as feels natural until they get sleepy. And that will come. If for, however challenging your sleep problems are, deep down inside there is a circadian rhythm that we need to find. And sometimes this is very difficult. Some people are living with chronic pain. They're on numerous medications, which are either making them sleepy or making the stimulants that are keeping them awake. Um, they often are dealing with mood challenges. Underneath all of that is a natural sleep rhythm. And it is our job to spend a little bit of time trying to understand when that is. For many individuals who are at home trying to fall asleep at 10 because they need to wake up at six, or maybe because that's when they're bed partner or family members are sleeping, if given the opportunity, they would stay up later. They'd go to bed later, hour later, two hours later, sometimes three, four, five, six hours later. I don't really care. I am, I am without judgment as to when it is, but we first need to fa understand what, it, what that time looks like. And so I have a lot, many individuals who if the whole world would let them, they would naturally fall asleep at about one, one o'clock in the morning. And then the second part of this Hawaii ex paradise experience is when would you wake up? I want you to sleep as long as you possibly can. Guilt free. Um, no one waking you up, no significant others waking you up, no pets or kids waking you up. All you're trying to do is understand what your deep, innate, primitive circadian rhythm is. And everyone on this call, all 707 of you have a slightly different circadian rhythm. Um, and this is important because you need to understand what yours is before you start making adjustments to sleeping better. And what yours is, is different from the person sitting next to you. It's, uh, it's different from family members. It's different from bed partners. Um, so once you have some idea of what that looks like, you can start to move forward. So I mentioned an example of someone who, if the whole world let them, they'd go to bed later. Some people are different. Some people, if the whole world let them, they go to bed, they get very sleepy at seven, eight o'clock at night, uh, and they would sleep, uh, they would fall asleep at that time. We'll go through a couple more examples of that in a moment. What is really important to recognize here when we start to think about your body's innate 24 hour circadian rhythm is that this is much more than just sleep. Everything about your physiology is tied into your circadian rhythm. Hormonal secretion, when you get hungry, when you need to go to the bathroom, when you are best at concentrating, when you are sexually aroused, all of these things have a rhythm um, that surges and decreases over the course of the day. And what you'll find is, is that once you scratch the surface on someone who has an underlying sleep problem due to their circadian rhythm, they often have all sorts of other problems. They have trouble concentrating when they're supposed to be concentrating. They have trouble exercise when they want to exercise. Uh, they have trouble with their appetite uh, at different times of the day. And that's really to understand that this is much more foundational than just sleep. All right, so in order to sleep better, and we're not talking about any sleep studies or any CPAP machines or any sleeping pills, any of that. We're talking about understanding and addressing your circadian rhythm and how well it aligns or misaligns with your goals. Uh, because everyone, myself included, everyone on this, on this, um, on this meeting 
could have a slightly better circadian rhythm um, and then adjust it accordingly because sometimes you need to wake up at six o'clock in the morning, other times you might need to wake up at eight. And this is a real problem with athletes who will perform at different times of the day. And I just wanna give a couple examples of circadian disruption in action. So back to our examples earlier. So let me take this first individual who uh, goes to bed at 10 o'clock and her mind won't shut down. And another individual who falls asleep at 10 o'clock uh, and then wakes up at three o'clock in the morning and can't fall back asleep. So we need to ask, uh, we need to ask ourselves two questions when you think to yourself, my mind won't shut down when I go to bed, okay? What happens in the evening? But more important than that, what happens in the morning? What happens on the opposite end of sleep? So in the, in the evening, when an individual goes to bed and has trouble falling asleep, they say, I feel tired, but I can't fall asleep. I really desperately want to fall asleep, but I can't. My mind races, this is incredibly frustrating. And it is. Nobody ever laid awake in a dark room and stared at a ceiling trying to fall asleep and thought about how great their life is. That is just something that doesn't happen. Um, but very important, same person who is having trouble falling asleep at night, what happens in the morning? Oh, when the alarm clock goes off, I am sleepy. I have trouble waking up. If I could sleep in several, I could sleep in several hours if I did not have to get up. That is really important to ponder, to so stop and ponder that for a little bit. This individual, if you thought about her Hawaii scenario, as we talked about before, she'd be going to bed later and she'd be sleeping in later. It may not be what she wants to do. She may feel bad about it, but that's where her natural circadian rhythm is. She has a delay in her circadian rhythm. And how you treat that is different from somebody else who may have a different circadian rhythm. How do you do it? So if this describes you or someone you know, or a teenager in particular, here's what you do about it. You recognize that the underlying problem is, is that this individual is living in the wrong time zone. And what you focus on is you focus not on calming the brain down at night, but instead helping the body wake up in the morning. And if you do that over time, you're going to start, you're going to, this individual is going to start naturally falling asleep earlier, better. So first thing to do, get bright light first thing in the morning. Uh, ideally, it is that uh, big fusing ball of helium in the sky, the sun, uh, which we sometimes have here in Minnesota. We had this morning, if I recall. Um, and uh, Or uh, barring that, especially in the wintertime, a 10,000 lux light box. These are the same sorts of light boxes used for people with seasonal affective disorder. Second thing you can do, and again, this is just for people with circadian rhythm delay. For somebody with a different problem, we would not suggest this, but melatonin, low dose, over-the-counter melatonin is a very reasonable strategy here, but don't think of it as a sleeping pill. Think of it as a circadian vitamin that is reminding you when the sun has gone down. And you wanna take a very small amount, a milligram at most, and take it several hours before bedtime. You wanna decrease light exposure in the evening. Um, obviously we enjoy our tablets, we enjoy streaming, we enjoy um, um, uh, FaceTiming and Zooming family members at night, but you wanna to try to decrease your light exposure as much as possible, especially an hour before bedtime. And the third thing to do and this gets at recognizing that your circadian rhythm is more fundamental than just your sleep. Start working on your meal timing. So if you have a circadian rhythm delay, start just very gently, start working on um, advancing your meal times. Maybe it's by as much as about 15 minutes a day. You just advance those meal times combined with the light, combined with the melatonin. And what should start happening is that this individual starts naturally feeling sleepy earlier and just as important, starts waking up and feeling more refreshed. Okay, let's go back. Let's go to the second individual who can't fall back asleep. Ask, you ask two questions. You start off with what the main challenge is, is what happens in the morning. But then you also, more important, ask the question, what happens in the evening? So this individual will say, it's only three o'clock in the morning, but I am clearly done sleeping. I lie there for hours, nothing happens, incredibly frustrating. I very much want to sleep, but I can't. Then, Here's, but here's, that won't give you the answer. The answer is, what happens in the evening? This individual may say, I'm very tired in the evening, and I'm very sleepy in the evening. I have trouble staying awake before bedtime. I'm dozing off while I'm um, spending time with my family or watching a show or reading. What do you think her Hawaii scenario, that her paradise scenario showed? Her showed a natural sleep circadian rhythm that's advanced, falls, falling asleep earlier, waking up earlier. 
she has an advance in her circadian rhythm. How do you, how do you address this? It's exactly the opposite. This is why blanket advice, which I have given before, confession, um, to everyone in terms of using light in the morning doesn't always make sense. One thing to do for this individual, what you wanna do is bright light um, in the evening. Um, remind her that the sun is still out to kind of push that circadian rhythm back, preferably with exercise. Um, um, exercise, particular, particularly aerobic exercise that gets the heart rate up, that keeps, that, that where an individual re will really get sweating can help. Second thing to do, Melatonin can be useful here, but not the way most people imagine it to be. You wanna take a little bit of melatonin if you wake up at two to three o'clock in the morning. And this isn't to put you back to sleep for the rest of the night. It's to help move that circadian rhythm so over time, over weeks, you'll be more awake and alert in the evening. And instead of waking up at three o'clock in the morning, you're now waking up at four o'clock in the morning and then now waking up at five o'clock in the morning. And again, as we talked about before, Work on mealtime. Recognize that these circadian rhythms are more than just sleep. Try to, try to if, you're, if you're trying to delay your circadian rhythm, instead of having lunch at noon, you can delay it by 30 minutes, 15 minutes at a time. Slowly work on adjusting your meal timing. Okay, well that's, that does not describe everyone. There are individuals who have, go to bed, can't fall asleep, they wake up throughout the course of the night, um, they wake up at two, they wake up at three, they wake up at four, uh, they can't fall asleep at any time. So what do you do, what do, you do for those individuals who are just, they're hypervigilant, their mind is rolling, not just at bedtime, their mind is rolling 24 hours a day. Um, couple, 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 um, couple rules to follow that will help you sleep over the long term. And by long term, over the medium term, I should say, over a couple of weeks. Um, first thing to do is again, be very, very careful. You don't have a circadian rhythm delay. And we didn't get a chance to talk about this but make sure there's no restlessness. There's no urge to get up and move or to get up and eat. Um, urge to get for people who are smokers, they'll often get up and have a cigarette. That is very important to identify. And if you have that at all, that can be addressed. Um, and then an individual can help fall asleep better. All right, second thing to do. So if this is for someone who is hypervigilant, their mind won't shut down any time of the night. This is difficult but don't go to bed unless you are sleepy. People, it is, when you're, when you're struggling with insomnia, oftentimes it becomes an overwhelming experience that can, occur, that can occur 24 hours a day. But if you are tired, if you're exhausted, if you really want to sleep, but you are not sleepy, don't go to bed. You are not allowed to, you cannot go to bed because that process of going to bed and lying there, trying to fall asleep and you can't, that's actually making the problem worse. Um, so what do you do? You get out of bed, you, you do something you enjoy. You can't do work, you can't do cleaning because ultimately once we get you sleeping better, we want you just sleeping at night. So we don't want you conditioned to getting those sorts of things done in the middle of the night. So don't go to bed unless you're sleepy. Get out of bed, go and do something you like, preferably not on a screen, um, although I realize that's getting harder and harder these days. Listen to music, read a book, outside of the bedroom, dim lighting, and then be mindful. This is where mindfulness is incredibly important. Be mindful when you start to get sleepy and then go back to the bed. And, what the, and then the, second, the third thing to do is make sure you don't fall asleep outside the bedroom. So if you, if you do everything right and you get out of bed and you go, but then you fall asleep on the couch, that's just gonna condition you to falling asleep on the couch instead of in the bedroom. If you follow these rules, what will happen is that you are gonna have some, a few nights in a row where you're really not sleeping at all, but the sleep you are getting in the bed is consolidated. So maybe it's just two hours or three hours, but good, deep, consolidated sleep inside the bedroom. And then you slowly start working on expanding it. So three hours becomes four and four hours becomes four and a half. And sooner or later, you get to a point where you are in balance with what your body's natural sleep need is. All of this is a three minute introduction to the field of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia which absolutely deserves uh, its own deep dive at a later time. And there are some great um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapists here in town, uh, one of which, uh, Dr. Michael Schmitz, is a really leading uh, uh, national expert on the topic. Um, okay, I hope that was um, useful in, um, in some small way to, to introduce 
the value of sleep and circadian rhythm challenges. Um, the, in addition to trying to start with a sleeping puppy, it's always worthwhile to stop uh, with a sleepwalking dog. And it's actually a, dream enact, a dog with dream enactment. Every time I've, every time I've given this, shown this video to any group of any significant size, uh, many people will note that their dogs do something like this. It's incredibly common, especially amongst Labradors and Golden Retrievers. What you see here is this isn't really sleepwalking. It's, it's better called dream enactment because what you're seeing is that this dog is clearly having some internal dialogue going on. They're thinking about a rabbit. They're sneaking up on a squirrel. Uh, maybe they're running to get a snack. Um, whatever it is, you can see that they're, that they're acting this out, which is very different from sleepwalking, which tends to be um, rather uninteresting, quite frankly, um, in humans or anyone else. All right. Um, so thank you all very much. I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a super informative session. Uh, we are getting a lot of questions in, and by far one of the most popular questions is regarding naps, and what is your opinion on that? Sure. So first of all, naps are incredibly healthy. Um, we would all be much better off if we encourage naps throughout life. Um, human beings are natural nappers. The reason why, for the most part, we don't notice this is because we're drinking uh, too much caffeine uh, during the course of the day. Uh, for those cultures that uh, have a prohibition against caffeine, they often have a culture of napping. Um, for athletes, especially athletes who need to perform in the evening, a nap can be the difference between having a successful professional or Olympic career or not. I mean, it is that big of a difference. Um, that being said, for individuals who are struggling to fall asleep at night, sometimes naps can be counterproductive um, because you, you, can, you can take away some of that sleep pressure that you may use later on to kind of fall asleep. So it's, it, it, needs to be, it needs to be customized to the individual. Great. Um, we're also getting a number of questions about um, the impact of hormone imbalances on sleep and um, specifically going through menopause and kind of tips for sleeping during that time. What, that's an incredibly important um, uh, point to bring up. So um, progesterone and estrogen are both soporific. They are both sleep promoting. So when women go through menopause, um, this often can lead to more sleep fragmentation. Um, it can lead to quite a bit of insomnia, especially if there's hot flashes associated with it. Um, the other thing is, is that progesterone is a ventilatory stimulant. It helps promote breathing. Um, oh, and I, so, I so wanted to avoid this conversation, but I have this topic, but I, I do have to bring it up, is that there are uh, some trials with COVID-19 where they're actually giving progesterone injections to help promote ventilation, even in men. Um, as, a, as a potentially life-saving uh, intervention. Uh, but since progesterone is a ventilatory stimulant, when women go through uh, menopause, that is the period of time where they're most at risk of developing obstructive sleep apnea. Great. Um, another question that we're getting a lot is about the number of hours that you should sleep ideally, and can that be different for every person? It's absolutely different from every person. And what I would ask, I get that question a lot, and how I flip it around is, is I, turn it, I turn it around and I say, better to focus on what is the natural timing of your sleep than on what the best duration of your sleep is. And let me, give you, let me explain to you what I mean. This gets back to that circadian rhythm challenge I was telling you about. If you have an individual who if the whole world let her, she'd go to bed at midnight, wake up at eight o'clock in the morning but you can't because of work, because of family, et cetera. That individual is tired and exhausted, so they fall asleep at 10 o'clock at night and she wakes up at six o'clock in the morning. Eight hours, getting eight hours of sleep, but she doesn't feel rested. Why is that? Is because the timing of sleep is not aligned to what she's trying to do. So the first thing to do is to recognize what her natural sleep timing is. Try to go with it if possible. Oftentimes that's not possible and then use the light and the melatonin 
and the meal timing to try to advance it so that it, net, it aligns better. And so for that individual who needs, you know, eight hours of sleep, sometimes getting seven hours of well-aligned sleep is better than getting eight hours of poorly aligned sleep. Um, but to, I don't want to completely avoid the question, Molly. Um, it, is, it is different for each individual. It, it varies most dramatically um, uh, across the lifespan, particularly during childhood. Um, most important probably to note is that adolescents absolutely need, um, even, even those in high school, absolutely need more sleep than adults do. Um, than 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 they are than they will when they are older. Um, at least nine hours of sleep is ideal, and I realize that as as a parent of teenagers, I realize how extremely difficult that is. But we are talking about developing brains. Um, we care about their schooling. We care about their mental health. We need to care about their sleep. Great. Um, another question that came in um, is regarding the relationship between dreaming and emotional regulation and learning. Can you say something about that, please? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I, I'd love to uh, expound on that one quite a bit. So question many of us ponder at some point of why in the world do we dream and why are they so bizarre? So what is happening when you're dreaming, you're almost always in REM sleep. REM sleep is taking emotional experiences you've had during the day um, or at some point, sometime in your past, and it is replaying them, which gets a lot at why we have emotions in the first place. So, you know, if you think about, if I asked you the question of, of uh, quick, think of something that, you know, horribly embarrassed you in middle school, probably about everybody on this call can, or junior high back is what we called it when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> we can immediately think back to about three different things. The reason why that is, is because that embarrassment, that humiliation, basically is your brain's way of saying, okay, Michael, this was really important. You need to remember this. Meanwhile, remembering something like what I had for breakfast three days ago doesn't have that emotional connection to it. So whether or not it's embarrassment or fear or joy or sexual arousal um, or laughter, all of those things are your brain's way of basically saying, okay, this is really important for you to remember. And it is during REM sleep that your brain goes back to these experiences and replays them. And it often replays it in ways that seem really bizarre, right? Like why is all of a sudden my coworker right now hanging out at this party that I'm dreaming about with my cousin who I haven't seen for 10 years? And the best way to explain that is dreams are your brain's attempt at file compression. It's trying to make sense of all of the different experiences that you've had um, in your life and it's trying to make sense of it. And it this is a process that is constantly happening. So it's happening last night, it's gonna happen tonight, it's gonna happen the next night. Your brain is constantly changing. So it's, it's gonna be different tomorrow than it is from now. And the truth is, it's actually different now than it was you know, 40 minutes ago, whether or not it's any better I guess you can post in the comments. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we've got, received quite a few questions about when is the appropriate time to kind of eat before you're about to sleep. Um, I know you mentioned that as um, one of the kind of tips for the different types of circadian rhythms. Sure. It, it all comes down to first, before we get there, we need to know where your circadian rhythm is to start. So for, you know, every, all, uh, 700 different people um, on this, the answer may be a little bit different for each individual person. But in what, we, what you should have, and this gets into larger physiological processes, is that it is a good sign that your circadian rhythm is intact and working, is that you should be able to maintain an overnight, a fast for about 12 hours without feeling hungry. So if you have dinner at six o'clock, seven o'clock at night, if you wake up at two o'clock in the morning, you really shouldn't be hungry. Now, a lot of people, if you are, that's just something that that's just a, that's just a sign that there's something going on with your circadian rhythm that needs to be addressed. Um, it's, it's part of normal human physiology. And this happens really early on, usually by about four or six months, the, the, human, the human physiology of, of glucose regulation, and insulin, growth hormone, cortisol, all of these things that are involved with appetite regulation should be in place to be able to very comfortably 
maintain an overnight fast without getting hungry. And if, and if, if I'm describing, if, if you are an individual who like, that's not me at all. I feel like I need to eat before I go to bed. I feel like I need to eat when I wake up in the middle of the night. That is, that is a sign that this is deeper than just a sleep issue, but it's an underlying circadian challenge. Great. Um, we are running out of time here, so I think this will um, be our final question for today. And um, someone had mentioned, you know, what if you can never have that kind of perfect um, Hawaii scenario to be in paradise? How do you identify what your circadian rhythm is? Well, and so, so it's worthwhile to point out that almost nobody can, including myself. <laughs> um, um, but you need to, that's why a little bit of, you know, that's why it's a thought experiment, right? That's why it's, it's something to be mindful of going forward. So if it's eight o'clock at night and you're um, drinking alcohol, or if it's eight o'clock at night, you're taking a medication that's sedating. When you take that, be mindful of going forward. Okay, am I sleepy because this is my natural sleep time? Or am I sleepy because of the medication I'm taking? This is hard. This is quite honestly, this is often the majority of what I do is to try to help people, individuals, tease out exactly what the environment is, what their lifestyle is, what exogenous medications and substances are versus what is the underlying intrinsic circadian rhythm. And oftentimes this takes a while to, to really come to uh, an understanding of. And if you don't know, that's important to know. It's important to understand at this point, like I don't know what my circadian rhythm is. Just understanding that is a tremendous amount of insight that you can take and move forward with. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise today. We received way more questions than we could ever get um, through in today's webinar. Um, so it was obviously a topic that resonated with a lot of people. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email um, with some sleep and well-being resources, as well as a recording of today's webinar and um, Dr. Howell's slides. So thanks so much for providing those. Uh, and we really appreciate you all taking the time today. Thank you. Thank you.